Hello, it's time for part two of our lesson, East Africa's land and water features. So what you're looking at in the photo is part of the Great Rift Valley of East Africa with the colored fields in the background. So imagine that you were with the Israelites, you left Egypt, you were headed through the wilderness, camped out near the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his Egyptian army were approaching and you looked up to Moses for comfort and assurance and Moses said, Behold, the Great Rift Valley is before you. And then he went on and say, Behold, the salvation of the Lord awaits. Well, of course, that didn't happen, but it could have. The Israelites were standing in the midst of the Great Rift Valley when they were about to cross the Red Sea in the southern portion near the Gulf of Agaba. So it would have been an amazing thing to see the waters of the Red Sea part and then to see the Israelites cross, to see the Egyptian army pursue them, and then the waters collapse on top of them, killing them. Well, stick around another 10 million years and you might be able to see something even more amazing. What a lot of scientists think will happen over time is that the Rift Valley that allowed for the creation of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Agaba will continue to expand and that the Red Sea will eventually fill in a Rift Valley in Eastern Africa and part of that continent will, in a way, break away forming a new continent. So where that would happen would be, start, would be south of this point that you see in the map here. Here's the Great Rift Valley of Africa. Choose a color that you can see here. So on the left you see three plates. These are parts of Earth's crust which are separating at different times and at other points in time rubbing against each other and causing uplift in the land. On the left is the Nubian, Nubian plate, the African plate. On the right is the Somalian plate. And then to the north or at the top of your screen is the Arabian plate. So at various times, they've either been pushing against each other and causing uplift, in which cases um, geographic features like the Ethiopian dome are formed and the Kenyan dome. These are highland areas. Or they've been pulling away from each other, in which case large fissures and cracks in the earth are formed, just like in the photo that you saw at the beginning. Sometimes water fills in these huge cracks. So if you're looking here, you see a large body of water right in the middle. That's Lake Victoria, second largest freshwater lake in the world. Farther to the south is Lake Malawi. And then between those two is Lake Tanganyika. And there are some other more, uh, some other important lakes in the region. But those are the most significant ones. Another important body of water in the region is the Gulf of Aden. If you live in Somalia or Djibouti, a lot of your shipping would take place through the Gulf of Aden. Remember the Suez Canal, as ships come through the Suez Canal, they eventually enter the Red Sea and from there pass through the Gulf of Aden into the Indian Ocean. Now as those plates on the surface of the earth spread apart, it creates weak spots in the crust which allows for volcanic activity. This mountain has three volcanic domes, none of which are currently active anymore, but it's the tallest mountain in Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro, is over 19,000 feet tall. So within that mountain area are a number of different climate zones, ranging from semi-arid all the way up to uh, masses of glaciers. Second largest mountain in Africa is also in this Great Rift Valley area, and that's Mount Kenya, over 17,000 feet tall. If you wanted to be a good runner, you could go train in the area of Mount Kenya or Mount Kilimanjaro. It'd be a good workout. So one of the challenges in the area is that people don't know 
when an area is going to be affected by, um, by volcanic activity or by seismic activity. So in this case, you see what happened to a roadway in Kenya when there was some seismic activity and the roadway split apart and there was a huge crack in the Earth's crust. In the 1800s, European explorers were excited about a lot of things having to do with Africa. One man named Livingstone decided that he was going to go to Africa and find the source of the Nile River. Well, he got very sick. He never was able to do that. But one of his friends, Stanley, went on an expedition after Livingston's death to do that. And during that, expe that expedition, he, he became the first European, European to find the Ruwenzori Mountains in Uganda. So after viewing this, if you want to click the link below the video in the lesson page, there's a slideshow showing a lot of the flora and the fauna of the Ruwenzori Mountains. It's really unlike any that you would see in the United States. Here's another water feature that's very important to this part of Africa as well. It's the Nile River. So of course we talked about the Nile being important to Egypt. Well, its origins are in East Africa. Its origins come from two major tributaries, the White Nile and the Blue Nile. The White Nile is called that because of all the sediment that it carries. And the Blue Nile is called blue because it looks blue when it floods. So nothing crazy about that. but. The White Nile begins in Lake Victoria, down here in Uganda, and the Blue Nile begins in the highlands of Ethiopia. Eventually, Stanley did discover a part of the source of the Nile River in the Ruwenzori Mountains, or what's sometimes called the Mountains of the Moon, in Uganda. Because the Nile River is such an important resource, People in the region are always looking at ways that it can be used better. One such project that was intended to do that to make better use of its resources was called the Sud Project, which started in Sudan in 1983. In Sudan, there was a civil war going on, so that project eventually stopped. But plans are to resume that project, and what it would do is it would create a canal that would allow the Nile River to pass more quickly through a swampy area called the Sud. So right now, what's happening is that the flow of the river is slowing down. A lot of its water seeps into the swamplands and eventually into underground aquifers. So on the one hand, the project would provide more water for areas to the north in Sudan and Egypt. It would be a good thing that way. On the other hand, a lot of the local people would be affected. A lot of those swamplands that they currently hunt in or, or use as irrigation for their farms would be affected as well. So here are some of the key bodies of water that you've learned about and some of the key landforms. As mentioned, check out that link to the slideshow of the mountains of Ruendor. How do you say that? Ruendorzi, Ruendozi, and then come back for part three of the lesson.